Hi, everybody. Hi. Wow, it is so great to be with all of you. You know, with so many of you, I have laughed, I have cried, I have cursed. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it depends. You know, it depends on what day of the week it was, you know. Um, and I think one of the things that kind of sets us apart is this real sense of family that we have had over all of these years. I mean, I see the very first photographer I worked with, I see the first photographer I worked with on my first big story, the first woman who edited one of my pieces, the engineer who said to me, the reason why you can't get a live shot out of New Orleans is because you don't have enough quarters to put, <laughs> to put into the machine. Um, you know, besides great mentors like Marsha Rose, who I grew up watching, and also, the woman who made me feel so at home when I looked at her the first day I walked into the station, and that's my friend Trudy Haynes. Yeah. It's like, hi, baby, what's your name? <laughs> you know, and you always made me feel so, so, good, at, so good about what I did for all the years of Channel 3, and uh, you've been a great inspiration to me also, Trudy. So thank you. I'm so happy that you're here. So we're going to begin, we have a, like a great lineup of people, and what I'm, I've asked a lot of them to do is to talk about the moment in the industry that was really transformational, um, where they really could see that the industry had shifted. And then also, a story that might include something that was transformational for them personally. Uh, because I think that that we, you know, each one of us kind of stood at the crossroads of so many things as the industry was growing. Um, also, the man who I always have been in love with is Tom Lemaine. He's here too. Yeah. One of the greatest, one of the greatest morning partners you ever could have. Like, you know, who else do you want to be with at three o'clock in the morning than Lemaine? <laughs> So I'm so grateful for that. Um, anyway, so we're going to begin, interestingly, with the woman who is still working because she just loves it. And she has so much energy and so much beauty. There's nobody who I know in the industry who is a better writer, more creative, and can take two facts and stretch them into two hours of a broadcast. And that's my good friend, Carol Erickson. Come on up, Carol. <laughs> and Carol, I'll be right back. <laughs> Here, take the podium. I love Pat Chiraki. Thank you. And she delivered what I wrote for her perfectly. So. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Once again, another great performance. Uh, you know, this is such an honor to be here, to, to come out here and see everybody, people that I have worked with for so many years. You know, when I started in Philadelphia, it was 1978. I was a newbie at 27 years old with only one divorce behind me. So I hardly knew what I was doing. That, of course, was going to change. And she asked for a transformational moment. I think probably all the years of covering snowstorms has changed me the most. I now would never go out into a snowstorm without a three-foot ruler. I ask every person I see, how was your commute? I also ask people, uh, your name and could you spell it, please, and where are you from? So I think all those things that, that you end up doing it's just by rote in your job all the time certainly changes you. You know, Channel 3, I, I was trying to think of what I was going to say today because I her topics were like, this is now like the blue book that you didn't really know what the question was, but you're going to write something. That's what this is right now. This is sort of free flowing because her questions are better than my answers are going to be on this. But Channel 3 is kind of like that lover you never got over, that you keep going back to no matter what. Good, bad, indifferent, they are in your system. And I think that's what Channel 3 was. 1978, when I arrived here, because they were desperate for a blonde that could fill the unfillable shoes of Jessica Savage. 
they didn't find her in me. <laughs> they found someone who would stay around <laughs> for a long time, and sometimes, uh, sometimes that helps too. So I've had amazing experiences with amazing people, and Channel 3 to me is not necessarily the stories, but it's generally the stories I've gone out on where I've met people that have impacted me, but I've worked so closely with the people in the truck, in the edit room, and Amico, don't you remember those? Uh, Irv Grotsky, when looting was going on in our live shot in Camden, Tom LeMaine, uh, you know what we went through in that weather department. <laughs> so we, we, we won't even go there. Uh, Mike Strug, who would play golf all around the, uh, the third floor of uh, Fifth and Market, you know, as our assignment editor, who also always said, it's a story either, because I'd call up and I'd say, Mike, nobody's at this meeting. It's a story either way. <laughs> so that got him off the hook, kept me on the hook. So I just, I just can't tell you how deeply I feel for the people that I have worked with, that Channel 3 is a number, but it's done a number on me. I have grown from knowing you far more than anyone has grown from knowing me. So I want to thank you for that, for being in my life, for staying in my life, for the opportunity on this momentous occasion to uh, talk to people who've walked this walk, who understand what a job can be. It's, it's not really a job, it becomes your life. So the people who populate your existence, that's your life. Channel 3 has been my life. You may know that I'm still there. They're probably saying, oh, but I'm still there every Sunday morning live, driving in, uh, and I do my pet segment because at 7.50 a.m. I will be calling each of you to wake you up at 6.30. Uh, because you know what a passion that is for me. So I, I think if you can find your passion in life and still do it, and I'm still working, so just, just a little shout out to where I work. If you ever go online, uh, three different places, intel.com, Bucks County Courier Times, uh, Burlington County Times, I do newscasts, I do Ask the Pet Fat, Value This with Dr. Lori and Antique Show. So various things, but no place could I ever work, no people could I ever meet that would be more meaningful in my life than the people that I have spent a lifetime with at Channel 3. And I wish everybody the best success in the world and good health and great memories. And thank you for letting me be here today. I want to add something in here, Car Carol donated a bunch of material to our archive. Some of it was very early. She said, don't let anybody see this until I'm not around. I looked at it, it was actually good. But that's not, the, the real point is that on one of the tapes, whoever was the engineer did not bulk erase the tape. So when they stopped recording, whatever was there still was there. So they recorded like a half an hour, stopped the tape. It was a 45 minute tape. Uh -oh. <laughs> so but it was at the end and it was Michael Jackson being shown around a hotel in Atlantic City. But what makes it really interesting and historic now, no matter what your political viewpoint is, because we are not a political organization, the person showing yeah. Michael Jackson around was Donald Trump. And if they would have bulked erased the tape, that footage would have been gone. By the way, on that 13 minutes that we have, Trudy Haynes did an interview with Donald too. It's probably the only copy that exists in the world. It's a, whether you, no matter what your political viewpoint is, it's still a historic piece of footage. Great. And we appreciate it in our archive. And if you people have material like that, we would love to have it. Super, thank you. Great, great, terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Trudy, you know, you talk to all of them. You know, Donald Trump and Dr. Martin Luther King. Holy cow. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. Um, okay, so, you know, 85 years. And so there's a beginning to the 85 years. And uh, a man who was right at that very beginning in the late 1940s was our good friend, Ed Hurst. Ed, I think we're gonna bring a microphone to you. Tell us when it was that you saw the industry change. 
or how it began? What was the birth of it for you? Have a mic for him? When I get a mic. Yeah, I know. I don't know. You got such a good voice still. No? There you go. Thank you, Pat. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I am the Stone Age Dick Clark. <laughs> uh, my first television show on Channel 3 was in 1947. I was the announcer for Pete Boyle in a show called Quick on the Draw, 1947. And uh, for the next 20 or so years, I managed to do a lot of shows on uh, Channel 3. Let me see. We did a show on Saturday morning that had a block that included Rex Trailer and his horse. I don't know how many people here would remember that. And then we had uh, Carol Reed and Charlie Dobson. Uh, it was a great lineup on Saturday morning. And then we did a show on Saturday nights at 6.30 called The Plymouth Showroom, where we would drive up in a Plymouth convertible at 1619 Walnut, which was the KYW building, and get out of the, um, the convertible, run into the studio, which was the Mike Douglas studio downstairs, and greet everybody. And, uh, of course, the Steel Pier was one of our stops, and we managed to do that for 20 years, but I spread that around every damn television station in town. <laughs> Finally, I went back to color radio to get even. But uh, the one show that uh, impressed me the most, and uh, believe me, I had the best crews in America on, on Channel 3, uh, was Ed Hurst at Aquarama. It was at the Aquarium in 1964 and 65, where we had go-go girls dancing with sharks. Nobody you know, though. But I had a wonderful time. And believe it or not, some of our directors turned out to be stars on their own. How many remember Joey Behar, who did Days of Our Lives for 100 years? Or Dennis Kane? who introduced uh, Dave Garraway on the Today Show. But uh, I had a marvelous time. I, I really did. And of course, we were in the KYW building, which was originally built uh, for radio. And Channel 3 needed a new studio. And so on the fifth floor, 5S, I think it was, we did our first Saturday morning show. But I, being around all these years, has made me very happy. That's what you think. But uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I have, I've had a wonderful career, and uh, I want to thank everybody at Channel 3 because they were very instrumental in a lot of our success. Right. You were, you, they, they launched you. Ed Hurst, everybody. Ed, thank you. So, you know, when they, when they decided that, um, that women should be on the air, they found a stunningly beautiful, dark-haired woman named Marsha Rose. And she was, they, they recognized her brilliance, her intellect, her drive, um, and also, more than anything, her integrity. So, Marsha Rose, the woman by one name only who is well known. Come up here, my friend. She's wonderful. And, and what a delight this is today, to be here and to see everybody and to remember almost everybody. It's, it's really been terrific. When, when um, Jerry Wilkinson called me and asked me to be here today, and talk about the 85-year anniversary of KYW, I thought he was asking me to recollect what I remembered those years ago <laughs> in 85 years, but then we straightened that out. So I want you to come with me to the 60s when KYW was WRCV TV. And, <clears throat> and um, we were very happy. We did very good work. We won awards. We had a wonderful, wonderful anchorman named Vince Leonard. How many remember Vince Leonard? I mean, he was wonderful. 
and did he really? And I just received a notice from somebody who is a member of this group, Alan Tripp, who is celebrating his 100th birthday. It's amazing. And um, so somewhere in the 60s, actually it was 65, but earlier than that, a very contentious lawsuit started between uh, the Cleveland station, which was KYW, and the, N between, and N the NBC station, which was in Philadelphia. And the issue was some suggestion of collusion. And the, it was a very acrimonious lawsuit. It finally ended. NBC lost. And they said, no, 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 we didn't do it, but we won't do it anymore. <laughs> and so the station, under the edict of the FCC, had to swap. Now, that wasn't really swapping call letters. It was physically swapping. And so Cleveland came to Philadelphia. Philadelphia went to Cleveland. And you can just imagine the emotional chaos at KYW, then WRCV. At, at that time, we didn't know who was staying in Philadelphia, who was going to Cleveland. Personal, time out for a personal story. I went to our program manager, Niels Van Els, and I said, look, I have all my tapes. I was then doing a program called Concept. It was a documentary. And um, I aired at 7.30 on Tuesday nights. And I said, please, could I have my tapes? You have no need to have them out in Cleveland. He said, no, 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 we're taking them to Cleveland. I said, but you're not going to put them on the air. What are you going to do with them? He said, we're going to put them in a warehouse. They will be very safe. And if there's a particular program you want, you can call me and get it. I said, no, no, no. You'll take them to Cleveland. You'll put them in a warehouse. The warehouse will burn down. And I won't have any tapes. And that's what happened. He took them to Cleveland. He put them in a warehouse. And the warehouse burned down. So those shows are gone forever, but back to, back to the narrative. Um, the station swapped, and we went home one night as WRCV, came back the next day to a studio that was KYW, and what the executives of KYW had done was paint the building overnight. We came back to a totally different building with all the public spaces painted blue. I don't, were any of you there then? Do you, do you remember that? This was in 1965. I mean, it was a brilliant psychological. <laughs> I was just looking at Macintosh, I don't know. <laughs> well, did, did, did I see a hand? Okay, okay. And, um, and with that, with, with KYW came some really very important changes. Biggest change, of course, was the Mike Douglas show, which really turned the town upside down, first by starting by closing Walnut Street in front of the studio one day so that um, um, Dinah Shore could play tennis with Burt Reynolds. And, and then they went to all sorts of important monuments and very important places in the city and did programming and events there, which was their way of saying, look, we are Westinghouse and we are here. And so we were Westinghouse um, for owned and operated station for a, a, a very long time. And, and changes happened as, as there were changes in the world um, there, were, there were changes in broadcasting, and, and we represented them. I, there was a time uh, back in the 60s when I was doing a talk show, and uh, I had as my guest um, a very voluble and articulate and explosive man who was talking about the Delaware River, and he said, that damned, odious, terrible... And there was a click, and the director's voice came into the studio and said, Professor McCarg, we can't have language like that going out after, over the air. Please be careful. Back now to the 70s, and, and, and just think now of cable, cable news and cable television and, and the vocabulary, where for the first time, and the executives were a little bit nervous, I could do a program on menopause. And in the mid-70s, um, Al Primo, uh, noting the change in the air, and, and it was a rating period, asked me to do programs on prostitution and gender change. Uh, it, there was a, a, a distinct change in the air. And then another change came, which was in 1995, when there was yet another change. And this time, it wasn't a physical change, it was a corporate change. And CBS, which was, the, was WCAU out here in the country, changed, <laughs> my urban residence <laughs> period, shall we, changed, and we became CBS Channel 3, 
and they became an NBC owned and operated station and we're a CBS owned and operated station. And it's, it's been a very happy time and, and CBS has been a wonderful family for all of us to live in and to make lasting, lasting friendships. And um, Mar Marcia Rose, let me, just, let me just interject here. I just wanna ask one quick question, sure. okay? As the first female news anchor on a major market right. station, how did that make you feel at that moment? Did you see yourself at, in a pivotal position? No, you know, it's very interesting. History makes us look back and realize how pivotal it was. Uh, there, uh, it was the first woman anchor person in a major market in the country. And, but it was just another day's job. I mean, it was, it was wonderful and you felt very good about it, but you had no sense of the real import it made at, at, the, at the time. Anyway, I just wanted to say how glad I am to be here today, and I'd like to be around to see the next 85 years. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Marsha Rose, everybody. All right, so um, when I came to Channel 3 in 1982, I sat down at a desk, and right across from me was a very tall man who um, I knew very well from television, and from watching him, and um, to be able to say, hi, my name is Pat Shiraki, and he said, hi, I'm Robin McIntosh, um, and I understand you're gonna do one part of the suburbs, and I'm gonna cover the other part of the suburbs, and he says, whatever it is you need to know, I'm happy to help you, and that always has been my good friend, Robin McIntosh, and his great generosity. Come on up, Rob. So, Robin, you saw so many changes that happened over the, how many years were you there? 40. 40, 40, 40 years. Here, you, you know, you know, stand here, might be easier yeah, for okay. you. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay over Hello. 40 years, all kinds of changes, and then things that really changed you too. Talk about those two. Well, I'll tell you about uh, transitions. At Channel 3, we were transitioning every <clears throat> few months, maybe every few years. Uh, Dick and I had a, uh, little thing we'd say, if the boss calls, get his name. <laughs> because uh, it was alluded to in the flyer here that uh, we went through a lot of different changes in the looks of the station, the looks of the newscast, and in, most importantly, the people in charge. Malcolm Poindexter and I used to sit right across from each other because I used to sit with Pat, then she became a big anchor, and I was sitting with the, uh, the reporter crew. And uh, awesome. Malcolm and I used to keep uh, tabs on the number of news directors we worked with. Uh, when he passed away, we were up to uh, 15 uh, and uh, about 10 general managers. So every time a general manager would come in, he would change the look, the sound, the feel of Channel 3 News. And every time the news director came in, he would change it again. So we were transitioning all the time. Um, it was a good, uh, what, what you do is you transition yourself. In the uh, 70s, when I began, uh, we were doing a lot of happy news. So I was the funny hat reporter. If there was a firehouse around with a pole in it, I was the guy sliding down it with a fire hat on. <laughs> and then they'd say, uh, well, McIntosh, the new news director would come and say, we don't need a soft feature guy, we need a hard news guy. So then I began reporting uh, hard news stories and I, pr I proved I could do that. And then the next guy would come and say, you know, we've got enough hard news. You are kind of the low man on the totem pole we need feature people. So all of a sudden I go put the funny hats on again. So I was transitioning all the time. Everyone says, what's the secret to being at one station for 40 years? Because every f few years I was a different guy. Uh, and uh, because of that, I was able to survive for 40 years in a very difficult position. I began as a copy boy, ended up as one of the longest uh, serving reporters in Philadelphia. And it was a great experience. And uh, retired now, enjoying my life. Very lucky, as the man said on television once, Channel 3 News has been very, very good to me. <laughs> very good to me. Hey, Robin, I got a question for you. On 9-11, um, on September 11, 2001, and you were sent to New York, the, when you first, when you got, got wind, really, of the smoke and the ash, and you ended up at one point in that week long without taking a shower and <laughs> you know, standing on top of rubble, I mean, just, just share with everyone that pivotal moment for you um, when you saw the United States of America under attack. Well, the, the worst part, of course, is you're in a marked live truck about, we were about uh, 10 blocks away from ground zero, but that's where all the local people were. 
My job was to go find local people who were responding to 9-11. I interviewed rescue workers from Avalon, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, d uh, different uh, rescue units from uh, Delaware. You couldn't really talk to them down at ground zero, so we were getting them as they were coming in and talking to them there. But of course, the worst part of 9-11 was because we were in a marked truck, parked uh, uh, not a significant, but a fairly significant away from the real center of the thing, people would walk by us with pictures of their loved ones, and they would knock on the truck, and we'd slide open the door, and we'd say, can we help you? And they said, could you please help us find my son? Can you please help us find my daughter? And what we ended up doing was we would scotch tape the pictures of these loved ones who were missing, uh, and by the time we were finished, there must have been 30 live trucks parked out on the same street, and the entire row of live trucks had at least 40 pictures on each of them. So we were, that's, when you look into the eyes of people who have lost, you know, loved ones, that really brought the whole thing home. It wasn't necessarily the ash, it wasn't the smell, but it was the visceral feeling of looking at people. And I went back a year later, and the people who uh, I had spoken with uh, the, a year earlier came up to me and said, you know, thank you for helping us out, thank you for listening to us. We never did find, you know, who, whoever it was, but at least, uh, you know, we felt better speaking with you. So that was 9-11 through my eyes. And, uh, you know, we had a, actually we had a thing at Channel 3, and we probably still do. For a long period of time, we were not allowed to show the airplanes hitting the buildings. We, that was considered way too upsetting for people. As far as I was concerned, who was there and talking with these people, they are strong. The problem is people didn't want to see America weak, but it wasn't. We were strong because we came back from it. And I think we ought to show those planes hitting those buildings every time we get a chance to, to remind a new generation that's coming along that doesn't understand what really happened because they see it maybe once a year if they happen to be watching A&E or something like that. But you know what? That was a terrible, terrible time, and this country came through it. So Robin McIntosh, everybody. So at, at that moment, you know, Robin was standing at the crossroads of history, and my good friend Trudy Haynes, years before that, also stood at the crossroads of history. Trudy, come on up, share a, a few of your thoughts, because as, um, as the woman in the country who broke, as they call it, the color barrier, it was, that was one piece of it, but you also elevated all that we are in the business because of how you are. And look at you today. Come on up. If I look around the room, all I can say is thanks for a second family for me. Being an only child, no sisters, no brothers, no aunts, no uncles, just friends. And that started for me in 1963 when I started on television in Detroit and was moved here, literally moved here by Al Primo in 1965. I was the only speckle in the bunch. But if you look around now, I'm still the only speckle in this bunch. <laughs> and yet I have a second family here in this room because I didn't have anyone else. All of the time that I spent with KYW until, I guess, 2000 or 20,000, what is it, 2000? 2000, yeah. 2000. And to walk into this room today and to know that I'm older than the station. <laughs> and yet, I have friends here who come up to me. Some faces I recognize, I recognize all the faces. I don't recall the names, because I, I wasn't one who memorized names. It was, hi, honey. <laughs> hi, sweetie. And I, I'm doing <laughs> that now, Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> and today, it's accepted. And I really want to say thank you to all of you for making Philadelphia my home. I grew up in Harlem, New York, and in Long Island, 
And so coming to Philadelphia was always a midway between going to Howard University, where I went to college. And I never thought I would come here to live. But I want to tell you, it's been gravy. Oh, there were some hard times. But if it wasn't for Pat and Marsha Rose, I can't even remember all the honeys. Yeah. <laughs> but they're sitting here. <laughs> Tom LeMaine. Um, what's the big, tall, handsome guy who was just up here? Robin McIntyre. Robin. Yeah. <laughs> Anna Miko. And some that even weren't working there, like my friend here. and Mike Nice. Yeah. Mike Nice. And just so many of you that made home for me not having a family. So now you are my family. And the only thing I regret, everyone that's been here has given you the feeling that we were one. And when I... When I'm out in the street and people do remember me, they remember the hair. <laughs> that lady with the white hair, that's what they remember. A lot of them come up to me and say, oh, it's not like it used to be. When you guys were on the air, you gave us the news. And now, after hearing everyone today, I know what they mean. There's a feeling that permeates this whole gathering of we did something that was, as you say, news breaking, but we did it collectively, we did it well, and they remember, and they do remember. Because a lot of people ask me, where is Eleanor Jean? Where is, uh, what's the other child that was with me? Um, they did all the food thing. And oh, uh, Orion Reed. Orion Reed. Yeah, right. And where is Malcolm? Some of them don't even know he's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So there was something about that unification that we had at KYW that people, when they talk to me, they're talking to all of you. They remember you. And they remember you for the kindness, for your intelligence, for your delivery, for making KYW a pinnacle of success. And I can't understand why more of us aren't here tonight or this afternoon. And I understand that some of the CEOs really don't care about us. And that makes me feel sad because of the broadcast pioneers, I have been able to continue that warm feeling with being in a second family. So I really want to thank you. They've been good years for me. They gave me a life and they have given me thoughts and remembrances. And I want to thank each and every one of you for that, particularly this young lady here and the young lady with the yellow coat on Stand Up in Marsha Rose because she was my only icon <laughs> and leader. I didn't have anyone to follow. And boy, I followed you with envy because you were so good and so beautiful. And I thank all of you for those memories. Thank you. Trudy Haynes, the one and only Trudy Haynes. There's a, there's a picture of Trudy in the, that's it. There's a picture of Trudy in the uh, hallway at Channel 3, and it's like the, the wall of fame. And Trudy is there, and she is wearing such a short skirt. And I got to tell you, what legs she has, you know? <laughs> just the best, just the best. Um, okay, see, where am I here? All right, so in terms of, um, you know, how it is that we do what we do, you know, so you have become so familiar with all of us who have been on air, but we have, we have st stood on the shoulders of the people who were off air to make us really who it is that we are, our photographers, our editors, our engineers. And there's a wonderful couple who I'm going to ask to come up, my friend Anna Miko and her darling husband, Gary Merkin. Um, Gary is the one who, when I was in New Orleans covering Pope John Paul II, uh, and I called and I said, I don't understand, Gary. How, why didn't we, why couldn't we get the live shot on? And that, he's the one who said to me, well, Pat, you just didn't have enough quarters to put in the machine. But, and literally, I think that that's exactly it. Come on up, Annie, Gary. <laughs> Annie also was a real groundbreaker. She was 
the, among the first women on the floor in the studio as a stage manager. She also edited one of my very first, if not my first piece, um, and always has been just a beautiful, beautiful friend. The two of them have been friends for many years, and then they found each other in love. Some, some memories, Annie. I know you prepared a couple of things just to remind yourself. <laughs> I did. I did. Go for it. I was hesitant to speak today. This is not my thing. I'm known for talking, but certainly not in front of big groups. Then I reconsidered, and I thought, I indeed want to go there and give everybody a little bit of my memories of 36 years at KYW. I was fortunate, very fortunate, to get a break, to be one of the first women in television in, uh, at KYW. And I was fortunate to work with some of the best anchors, one of which is here, reporters, writers, producers, directors, and of course, my technician buddies. So I remember sharing uh, lipstick with Jessica Savage. I remember Vince Leonard at the end of the 11 o'clock news, coming to my apartment with the entire news team for kind of um, fun and libations. So we had a, a, a very- Libations first and then fun. And then fun, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Late one evening after the 11 o'clock news, one of my reporter friends said to me, can you help me put a few pieces together? I'm gonna send something in for the Emmys. So I said, sure. And we started the process. Well, I'm editing and I turn around and the room is full of people. They're all editors and reporters and all our friends. And I'm like, well, what's going on here? Well, they were all there to help us. They had suggestions. They wanted to do this piece, that piece, whatever. At that moment, it was like my aha moment. I realized that we were not just co-workers, this was a family. And we put it together, we left at five o'clock in the morning, but it was well received. I don't, rem I don't remember whether she received her Emmy or not, but. So I could continue with stories all day and all night because after 36 years, you have plenty of them. But one thing that I wanted to convey is what Carol said, this is a family. I was so blessed to be able to work at KYW, and all of the people that I worked with became my family. And I just want also to say thank you. Thank you to Trudy and to Marsha Rose and to Pat. And I have a story about Pat. Did you? Yes. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Pat and I decided many years ago that we were not gonna whine. Right. Because it was beneath us. <laughs> Forgot about that. That we would champagne. <laughs> oh! <laughs> that was us, we would champagne. So every time I'm a little down and I want to complain, I think about Pat and I think, hmm, I'm going to champagne my way through this. And that's what I do. So I just wanted to say thank you as well. I have a wonderful family. Thank you. Anna Miko Merkin. Thank you. Good. Good job. Well, between Anna and myself, we had 51 years in that place. So I'm not sure if I have to do this in a lot of time. <laughs> no, I only I looks hard everything. I know. Uh, no, it's only four pages of, of 14 point types. It's not gonna be. <clears throat> W3XE, WPTZ, WRCV, KYW, CBS3. It sounds like one is reciting some kind of esoteric eye chart. These letters represent 85 years of Philadelphia broadcast history. Between us, Anne and I, we participated in 51 of those 85 years. The result is a lot of memories. A very small percentage of them were tragic. However, most of them were fond and a few were truly hilarious. I want to start out by mentioning a few good people we lost during those years that were not only fellow broadcast colleagues, but were friends. The one tragic work-related event that stands out in my mind was the July 14, 1979 helicopter crash that took the life of Special Programs Unit Photographer Bill Loomer. 
Bill was well-liked and admired by all who worked with him. I remember him moseying into our ENG shop and standing over us, putting, uh, puffing on his pipe and watching in wonder as we worked troubleshooting the electronic equipment, cameras, videotape machines, radios, etc. Months after his passing, I still felt his presence and, and the lingering aroma of that ever-present pipe as I worked on the equipment. I didn't forget there was another life lost in that incident. It was Dan Pruse, a freelance videographer. I didn't know Dan, but felt he needed to be remembered here today. The other lost friend I want to quickly mention is Larry Mason. Larry was fatally injured when his experimental aircraft crashed while he was doing uh, one of the things he loved best, flying solo on a beautiful day. Larry was a gifted videographer and was always coming up with ideas that added to his craft. One day he came into the shop to, with some help with a contraption that he, uh, well, what, what, would look very much what we call today a jib. He called it Mighty Mason Cam. It was a long boom on wheels that held an ENG camera that could tilt, pan, and swivel with a few twists of a control wheel on the opposite side of the boom. I can't help think if Larry had survived, today's jibs would have a Mason Cam logo on it. I just wanted to mention a few other folks from KW I wish were still with us. Alphabetically, Mike Boyer, Bob Bradley, Bill Custer, Gary Gears, Jack Jones, Joe Kirsch, Malcolm Poindexter, Rick Rakowski, and Joe Ewing. I consider them friends and miss them all. Let's move on to more cheerful memories. Okay? Yeah. 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 First day on the job. It was a typical November day in 1976, and I waited for an audience with the news director, Ken Tiven. When my turn came up, I found myself sitting with the bearded, cigar-puffing, smiling head of the department I would work in for the next five years before being transferred to engineering. After a brief conversation about what would be expected of me and to expect what to expect from KW, Ken brightly announced, I know, you can go down to the Mez and help Ann with a live shot. Enthusiastically, I replied, great, leaving his office on the second floor, headed for the elevator, wondering what curtailed the live shot, who was Annie, and where on the mez I was to report. Stepping off the elevator and being somewhat familiar with the mezzanine layout from previous tours of the plant, I headed toward the master control telecine area, seeking out my current perception of live shot equipment. Seeing nothing that matched my anticipation, I asked someone to point me in the direction of Annie and the live shot control room. I got a silent pointing finger to a little dark hidden corner of the area that looked like a, a drawn shower curtain. I approached with caution, not wanting to invade anyone's privacy if they were indulged in a personal hygiene project. <laughs> Lightly knocking on the frame of the structure, I announced my presence after a come in announcement. I meekly slid open the curtain, and there was Ms. Ann Amico with an attentive, concentrated look on her face and two eyes that looked like saucers come in, commuting by radio to an eyewitness news truck crew, also new to this procedure, all determining what channel, direction, and polarity from which the shot would be originating. Thus began a long friendship between Ann and myself, which would be interrupted by fate to develop into a different type of relationship. That's a story for another Pioneer Luncheon. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you have enough patience. Okay. Yeah. Two, more, two more stories and okay. I'll be done. All right. All right. One of the people I mentioned earlier was Joe Kirsch. Joe was a highly skilled technician that performed maintenance on KYW studio control room equipment. He was a quiet man, but beneath the solemn surface lurked a razor sharp sense of humor. One day, an ENG shooter came into our shop in the rear of the mez with a camera that suffered a loose lens assembly. I determined that this was caused by a strip screw that had to be replaced. At the time, we didn't have any supply of metric hardware uh, needed for the Fuji and Canon lenses that most of the street cameras utilized. I needed to re-tap and drill the case of the lens to install a compatible 632 screw. This required a drilling of the old metric size hole. The drill press, press equipment was in our engineering shop around the corner down the hall from ours. Grabbing the appropriate drill size, I exited our shop, strolled down to the engineering shop, passing Joe, who was seated at the bench, concentrating on a video monitor he was troubleshooting. He didn't acknowledge my entry into the shop as I passed him, heading toward the drill press. I installed the drill in the bit, the press, 
I carefully aligned the lens assembly under it and switched to the, the press motor on. Still nothing heard from Joe. As I started to slowly lower the rotating drill into the lined up hole on the lens frame in a droll, monotone voice, without looking up from his intense project, Joe muttered, when you hear glass, stop. <laughs> Both exploded with laughter and we, in a few minutes we continued our uh, completed projects. Last one, promise. Uh, as ENG news gathering equipment was growing in popularity and, this, and necessity, KYWT was increasing its fleet of live trucks. One fine summer morning, Rich Prim and myself find ourselves on Fifth Street in front of the station on the roof of a brand new ENG truck performing some modifications to the pneumatic mast assembly. You must understand that in those days, Fifth and Market in front of the station was a wonderful place to be in the summertime. The hustle and bustle of the people passing by. Weatherman Bill Custer's garden. Stavros's food cart, okay? And a rather large fruit stand selling all varieties of juicy delicacies were sights and smells to behold and enjoy. Last page. <laughs> Out of the corner of my eye, I spot a, a, a large box truck slowly pulling into Ludlow Street on the south side of the building from Fifth. I didn't know why, but had a feeling about this. I turned to Rich and said, we're about to be entertained. This is going to be good. The back of the truck was open, and a couple of people, one of them with some kind of stick, was standing at the rear of the truck with intense looks on their faces. It was, a, it was dark inside the truck, so we couldn't see what it contained. The individual with the stick walks into the truck, disappears for a few seconds, and then emerges, leading a full-grown elephant, using the stick as a persuader. He manages to position the elephant so it faces the front of the station and all of the splendor I previously described. If a pachyderm can get a look of surprise and joy on its face, this was the time when it spotted the fruit stand and all it had on display. At the same time, the fruit owner got a completely opposite look on his face. And as he spotted the animal that was now starting to move, uncommanded by the trainer, towards the stand. Where does an elephant have lunch? Anywhere he wants. <laughs> by this time, Rich and I were in mild convulsions, leading on the mass of the truck so we wouldn't fall off. Our convulsion level escalated as the fruit stand owner threw himself in front of the stand with arms out, his back pressing against the displayed goods. The trainer, now fully aware of the situation, was desperately attempting to deflect the elephant's path with a quick snack while the fruit stand over owner was flailing his arms and legs. I suppose in an attempt to appear larger and trying to cover the entire area of the stand as our gray friend inched toward it. After what seemed like an eternity, the trainer managed to divert the beast in another direction, knowing that out of sight meant out of mind. All was well again, much to the relief of everyone, especially the fruit stand owner, who seemed rather limp and drained. That's all I have time to tell. Let's move on. All right. Gary Birkin, enemy go. I wonder if that fruit stand owner gave the uh, trainer a bill after all of that. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so, you know, when you look outside and you look at the weather, you go, gee, it's sunny. Gee, it's raining. Wonder how many inches of snow we're going to get. For me... I wouldn't listen to anybody else except Tom LeMaine yeah. because I would know that LeMaine would always have it right. Tom LeMaine, my good friend, come on up. <laughs> Tommy, you saw, you've seen a gazillion changes in the industry and, um, and we were there together for so, so much of what it is that really has become Channel 3. Give us a couple of recollections for everybody. Transformation? I had a, I had a bunch of them. Actually, I ran out of things to do. Um, by the way, Trudy, I'll always be honored to be a member of your family. You are always going to be my sister. And that's for damn sure. And you know, I know I'm in the right place if Marsha Rose is in the room. I never got a chance to work with Marsha, but the closest I came was just before Vince Leonard retired, I got to share the anchor desk with Vince. And to me, it begins and ends with you two guys. Really, honest. You know, I, I uh, Marsha Rose. 
I was injured playing football, and as a result, I was sent up to the sports booth. I never, ever, believe it or not, how fortunate I am, I never sent out a resume tape. I never, never did anything like I wouldn't know how to do that. I'd have to hire somebody. Uh, but I was up to the sports booth, and then Atlantic City, uh, later that summer, they gave me a job spinning records, and then I got into record hops, and that fortunately got me through college. Uh, radio station named WIP happened to hear me on the beach in Wildwood, and uh, I spent a couple of years at WIP. I was doing a uh, marathon for the March of Dimes, telethon actually, and the uh, general manager at Channel 17 called me in and said, we just hired Bill Campbell to do the Sixers, and we need a guy to partner with him. And uh, it turned out I was the guy. And I um, spent a few years doing Sixers broadcast. I did the 9-73 and 73 year. I still hold the record for 73 losses in an NBA season. <laughs> however, however, 10 years later, I also broadcast the 76ers sweeping the Los Angeles Lakers in four games, and they gave me a ring, All right. a champion. All right. That was, uh, that was three years after I was the sports anchor along with Bob Bradley. He and I were the only two sports guys at Channel 3 when all four teams went to the championship game. The Sixers lost to the Lakers in game six. The Flyers lost to the Islanders in that famous offside call in game six. The Eagles, heavily favored, lost to the Raiders in Super Bowl 15 but the Phillies won game six against the Kansas City Royals. And Bob and I were the only sports guys. And it was amazing, because Channel 3, as Robin mentioned, had gone through a lot of changes. And one of the changes was, you know, we're, we haven't found anybody to replace anybody who was already replaced. It was crazy. So at the time, I was also doing Flyers uh, pre-game, post-game show. And uh, Steve Eisman is in the room. He still has enough hair that I didn't scare all of it off him. <laughs> Steve was my sports producer. When I was doing Flyers post-game show at Channel 29 and Channel 3 Sports at Channel 3 a half hour later, less than a half hour later. Fortunately, Channel 29 and Channel 3 are across around the corner from each other. Uh, but I was two live sports shows on two different radio TV stations in the same half hour. And Steve would be wait, waiting for me at the corner of Fifth and Market with a copy in hand. And uh, I would just walk in and go right on the set and do the games. So Steve, uh, thank you for putting up with all those years. Uh, I get asked after um, 83, I had been asked at some time back in the late 70s, Joe Whitty was our weathercaster back then. And uh, Hurricane David was coming up the coast. And Joe Whitty was called down to cover the storm. And the management at that time, I had done six o'clock sports that night. And the news director came in and said, we need you to do the 11 o'clock weather. And looking around, I was the only guy in the room, so they must have met me. And uh, I said, I was preparing. I had the lineup for the 11 o'clock sports. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> what makes you think I can do the weather? Well, you're a fighter pilot in the Navy. You must know something about the weather. Well, yeah, but that's all military. So I filled in for Joe Witte. And every once in a while, I would fill in when he was on vacation. And in 1984, the station called me and said, we have to make a decision whether you're going to do sports or whether you're going to do full-time weather. And after I had already done, you know, the, the four championship games and got my ring with the 76ers, I said, yeah, let's try weather. However, however, being a jock for 15 years, how would people really believe, Pat believes aimlessly anyway, <laughs> but how would people believe what I'm saying about the weather? I'm a sportscaster. So the station agreed to pay for my uh, master's degree at Drexel University in atmospheric science. And I really wanted to do that too because I wanted to do my own forecasting and I wanted to give myself a little self-satisfaction out of it. And that was another one of the transformations. I, I, had, I had done news with Pat in the morning when we did that at one time, 15 minutes weather show, I guess, early on, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, that was, yeah. Then we did just, hours just before hours. the Today Show. Yeah, right. And then I did weather. and. I had done sports, and um, as I said, I ran out of things to do. So um, I had, uh, in 18, 1985, it might have been 1885, <laughs> I had agreed to do weather. And I really believe that that transformation 
extended my career in television. I mean, I was on the air at Channel 3 for almost 40 years, and as Robin McIntosh mentioned, we went through at least a dozen different management changes, and none of those guys saw fit to fire my tail and get me out of there because every news director and program manager comes in and thinks they have a guy who can do better than you. And probably he did, but they never got to me. And so um, a couple of years ago, I finally said, yeah, that's it. Let me go out the front door before they show me the back. And uh, actually, I was on the air five years on camera, five years beyond my retirement age. And I said, you know, I've been getting away with it for a long time. So uh, let me say hasta la vista to Channel 3 and all the great years I had there and the great years I had at WIP, thanks to Dean Tyler. And uh, like I said, I ran out of things to do, and I wanted to make sure that after spending that long a time at one great station, I wanted to go out on a high note, and I certainly did. And you Pat sure did. had a lot to do with that. Yeah. Thank you very thanks, much. Thanks, baby. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about weather, we talk about the news, we talk about the various programming, but back in the day, we really had a soap opera on the air that was, that was live, a live soap opera. And we have one of the stars of that soap opera with us. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome the really lovely Claire Kasser. Come on in. Everybody, this is a tough position to be in, following this, this beauty here and the other beautiful women and the lovely men that spoke. I hope you're still awake. It's not nap time yet. <laughs> Could be. I have notes with me. I hope you'll bear with me while I consult with them. You know, at the end of this, I was going to put on my hat and take it off to Broadway, broadcast pioneers. I'll do it to begin with, because you deserve to have everybody's hat taken off to you. So going, going backwards now, Jerry found out about me through a niece and invited me to come here to speak with all of you. So Pietro's Place was the name of the very first soap opera that emanated from the city, from the station KYW-TV. It was on a seven-city hookup, and it was played weekly for a year and a half at noontime. So everybody ran to the bars in those days to look at television to see Pietro's place. Pietro was the father. I was the ingenue daughter, Tina, and all the action took place in our restaurant. Typical Italian motherless family. So he was mother and father. There was a lot of drama involved in this. I'd like to step back a little, giving you a prelude of what led up to that. Um, in the summer of 1994, when I, don't do your math, it's okay. When I was about uh, 14 or 15, I was selected to act at KYW Radio. At that time, for me, only a summer, se summer season because I had to go to school. It was an educational series, and it was called Colonel Bill. The good colonel was very nice to me. It was my first experience, and I was very scared, and I had to cry, and I didn't know how to cry, <laughs> but he taught me and then from then on, I could cry on cue. Um, going forward, there was a company called Philadelphia Experimental Theater. It was conceived by a woman who only had to be called Mrs. Mitchell. You couldn't dare call her anything but Mrs. Mitchell. She uh, directed, she cast, she produced only original plays by local playwrights here in Philadelphia, which was an interesting idea. This was backed by the Art Alliance, 
In fact, the building that we used was right in back of the Art Alliance, the 17 to 1800 block Panama Street, which is a very charming, quaint street. Visit it sometime if you can. Uh, it, the first floor was converted to a tiny little theater. And uh, at that time, before the show started, uh, that particular show, it was said that um, the famed conductor, um, Leopold Sikorsky, lived there. And he occasionally, maybe not so occasionally, would take nude sun baths on the upper deck. <laughs> Talk about waving a baton. <laughs> um, well, we're all adults, right? Oh, right. there's a little girl. It's all right. <laughs> Claire, that, I have to tell you, that's the line of the entire luncheon. <laughs> so you know what? Well, I, you, I, know you have, I know you have so many different little details that you want to share, but give us more of an overview about how it felt to be in that moment um, at the very beginning of television, doing these kinds of live broadcasts. Because I, I, what I think would be really great is some of these great details should be incorporated into the Broadcast Pioneers website. I think Gary's um, commentary should be as well. Mm -hmm. but, but give us that overview, Claire, because I think that people would really like to know that. Well, quite frankly, I mean, I was, I was quite young. The industry was young. Of course, that's the very best time to enter any kind of an industry on the ground floor. You have more opportunities. Uh, you have less competition. And I was absolutely thrilled. At that time, my uncle uh, was a well-known attorney, and he looked over the contract that was given to me. And when I look back, I thought, gee, he was a very smart fellow, but I think I got paid like $150 a week. And <laughs> that wasn't very much money then. So I don't know how good a negotiator he was with finances, but I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. It was, um, it was a very special, rare opportunity. And I'm still thrilled to be in the industry at this point. But I'd like to back up and go forward. Because, because we, you know, we're kind of limited on time. So, in okay. so to really capsulize for us the, the experience, if you right. don't mind. Okay. Because we have a couple more people we'd like to hear from. Yes, all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to the basic part of this. Unbeknown to the cast, the night that we had this performance at Philadelphia Experimental Theater, there was a talent scout in the audience. At the end of the show, he invited several of us to audition for the new soap opera. And luckily, I was chosen to have the lead ingenue role in it. Ernie Kovacs, which Mike and I were talking about, was also doing a show at that time. And sometimes he would come downstairs to the um, sound room and schmooze with the, with the guys in there working. And um, I had just completed a scene with my love interest. It was a, and he had to kiss me. Well, we had to do that take about four times because I lost it. I mean, he was such a fabulous kisser. <laughs> I mean, I still get a little hot when I think about that. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a forward. A round of applause for hot. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go forward a little and tell you that there was a kinescope taken at that time. I clearly remember it. And Jerry's been looking for it. So far, he hasn't found it. So if anybody knows anything about it, we would dearly love them to contact Jerry. Um, Preceding this, I just want to add that my very first commercial was for Westinghouse Refrigerator during the run of the show. I'm still doing that type of thing now. Uh, after the close of Pietro's place, my mother said to my father, look, uh, let me take Claire to New York. We'll live at the Barbizon Plaza for women, and um, she can accept the William Morris agencies of, pardon me, the William Morris agencies offered to represent her. My father said, you'll stay home and she'll stay home. And we did. 
if you want to get a hoot, here's a little commercial. You can check my website on clairecasser.com or actress for you. I want to give kudos to Broadway pioneers for your valuable research on our exciting industry. It's also captivating to anticipate the amazing strides, innovation, and impact of te technology, which will continue to contribute as, as time marches on. Thank you, Jerry, for inviting me here today, and for all of you listening to an old history lesson from an antique ingenue, transformational, transformational ingenue. Happy birthday, CBS. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> And she continues to be stunning on top of that. Claire, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of those thoughts with us. Um, okay, so there was a time when um, there was a photographer and a reporter who um, got together and to, they decided that they were going to, the station decided they, they should create a different kind of brand. They called that brand Car 3. And we have the photographer and the reporter who put Car 3 on the map. That is Irv Gradsky and Mike Strug. The two of you, come on up. I love both of these men. I've worked closely with both of them. Irv, my photographer, on a really pivotal story for me when I first started at Channel 3 in 82. Gentlemen, do your thing. I wish I had spoken to Robin and asked, how do you do 40 years at the same station? Because I hold the distinction of being fired at all the stations and <laughs> <laughs> moving on. But, and did 10 years at Channel 3. Uh, and when you come back, the friendships are still there. There's still warm feelings for all those people that you worked with for 10 years and most closely with this fella here. You know, the one year that Mike and I worked closely together. I think it was 1985. 84, 85. 84, 85. It only lasted a year, unfortunately, because of a change of, of general managers. But that one year, the freedom that we had to do whatever we felt like doing, we didn't have to ask anybody permission to do a story. We just came up with the stories on our own. Uh, sometimes we got up in the morning and over a cup of coffee at his he house. Pick, we both lived in the Northeast. Yeah. He would come and pick me up, and and then uh, we would sit and have a cup of coffee, right. uh, maybe eat something, and then start driving and see if we could come up with a story that day. Occasionally, we might have something planned, yeah. but often we were just driving around waiting for something to happen. It was, uh, by the way, designed or the, the idea came from Pat Palillo, and here's the address. Uh, he it was designed to kind of be. Uh, a Clark to Leon column, if you remember Clark in the Inquirer, who would write about things happening in the city. We could do whatever we, literally whatever we want. I remember standing on the sidewalk one day, we're on Delaware Avenue, and a guy goes by on a motor scooter with a dog in a milk carton behind him. And we followed the guy, turned out to be a, co a retired cop, and every day he would bring his dog down uh, uh, to Penn's Landing. And that turns out to be a story. There were a lot of fun stories, but there were also some serious stories. Uh, the one that comes to my mind the most is a, w one in, in central New Jersey, in central Jersey, I believe I, it was. I know where you're going to go on this one. The Sheptock family. Uh, this family was unique. I mean, they were a, a great family, but they were unique because the kids were all disabled. They either had no arms, no legs. I mean, it, it was just remarkable how this family 30, functioned. 32 kids. They had 32 kids in the family. I think there were six natural children, and the others were all adopted. Yeah. By the way, I happened, because I was doing this today, I hadn't looked at this stuff in years, but I had I had uh, the video, and I looked at it, and I saw the Sheptock family as one of them. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I looked at it and thought, hey, these aren't terribly embarrassing, even though I'm looking at them years later. You say, hey, that wasn't bad at all. 
Yeah, we had, we had uh, an amazing time with that story. Sometimes when I think about it, it brought tears to my eyes. I mean, it was that emotional to see this family functioning with these kids as disabled as they were. It was just an amazing story. Um, but going back to some of the fun stories, the one that sticks in my mind the most is uh, Ringing Rocks County, uh, County Park yeah. in Bucks County, I guess it is, and in Upper Bucks County. And it's just a, in a big clearing, there's a, it's a huge, as far as you, the eye can see, it's just big boulders, rocks, whatever you want to call them. And we found out that if you took a hammer and hit each rock separately, they came up with a different note on the scale. So we just went out there and I videoed Mike hitting rocks from different angles, of course, wide shots, tight shots, the hammer hitting the rocks. And then we took it back to the station and I don't remember who the gentleman was John, at the station. John Bulak, and I'm not sure if John Bulak was the name he used on air. <clears throat> I had gone to college with him, and he may have used a different name, but he was a musician. And so he, he told us what notes we had to use uh, to make songs. And we ended up uh, putting, uh, playing rock around the clock on the rocks. And simple things like Mary had a little lamb, I yeah. think, and things yeah. like that, but it worked. And we had, in the editing process, we had Mike jumping around from yeah. one rock to the other. It was really a, a good, a visually, it was, a, I thought, a, a fun story. Um, we did a lot of uh, interesting stories. Um, one story that, int that I, I tell all the time is that we went out to L.A. with the Phillies. And the car three, if you saw, I have, in fact, I have a picture. Car three uh, had decals on both sides, saying car three, obviously. By the way, we thought they were going to get us a Cadillac for car yeah. three. <laughs> we were going to have a fancy car. Well, it was a Nova. It was a... No, it was a um, uh, Pinto Pontiac Tempest, I think it was. Whatever it was, uh, they uh, shortly after we got that car, remember the assistant, uh, uh, the National Traffic Safety Bureau came out. This car failed the safety tests. <laughs> I, I went, I went to the assistant news director. I've forgotten his name. I said, "Hey, this car that you got us, it failed the the, the safety tests." He said, "Drive carefully." <laughs> But interestingly, we couldn't take the car out to L.A., obviously. And this, the car was a very important part of what we did. Every piece, almost every piece that we did had the car in the pick, in the, he would do a stand-up at, at the close with the car behind him, showing the, you know, the decals and everything. But we, because we couldn't take the car to L.A., they, they found the car at the exact model, same color, out in L.A., and the, our art department, our Crack like, art department made these magnetic decals uh, that looked exactly like what we had on the car, and so we stuck it on the side of the car, and we did, mm -hmm. you know, um, his stand-ups with this thing. We couldn't do rolling shots, of course, but we did him stand-ups with this magnetic things on the on the back on the side of the car. Yeah. Um, the wives came out there with us, if you recall. Yes, and um, they went while Mike and I worked the, at the ballpark. Uh, the ladies went out touring, touring, yeah. yeah, and they got somehow managed to miss the tour bus. <laughs> right, they got stuck someplace. You're right. Hey, I, I see her standing here rushing us. Let me, yeah. let, let me, yeah, yeah. Two, two, two yeah. Two, <laughs> two quick thoughts. One, to, to uh, you know, kind of confirm what you were saying. It, it, this was a classic example of the teamwork that that goes into this. People, and you folks know this, they see us on television, they think, Strug did it. And Strug didn't do it at all. Grodsky did it. And, you know, and the editors, the, the producers, all the people you worked with made this happen. We, we were a team. It's the only way it could work. Now, you're saying the change, talking about transitions, okay? Uh, I, I don't watch a lot of local TV. I don't see a lot of feature reporters. Or reports, uh, the Don Pollocks, Sheila Allen Stevens, those kinds of people, who you expected them to do interesting feature stories. It, it just doesn't happen very much anymore. But we did this for a year. You know, everybody liked it. Then we changed news directors. The explanation we got 
was, uh, so, uh, let me say, I think the reason they ended it was they could afford to have a reporter do one story a day. They couldn't afford to have a photographer do one, one story a day and edit and do all the other work. So it, it came to an end, uh, you know, after, after about a year. Uh, it was the best gig I ever had. There is no question that, you know, you, we felt a, a feeling of satisfaction and friendship uh, with all these people that we that came to work with, it was a, it was an interesting uh, moment. It doesn't exist anymore. Let me tell you that they ended it as I was about to go on vacation for two weeks. The news director, whoever it was, said, "Hey, we're ending Car Three. We don't want to do features anymore. Something like that. Features are over." I went away, went on vacation, came back. My first story. The day I came back, we're not doing features anymore, was the watermelon spitting contest. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. I, yeah. No, I was going to Mike, Mike, to me, anyway, uh, and I've worked with some amazing reporters and amazing writers, so I think that Mike was one of the most creative writers I have ever seen. Thank you. Anyway, anyway how lucky. Uh, we're all of us. And we talk can about I, a. Can I say, yep. Three, where are you? <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Okay, Thanks, you got more yeah. things? Did you no, do? Okay, done? Thanks. Great. Okay. Th guys, thank you. Uh, Mike. Uh, I just want to say one thing. We usually do not announce our Hall of Fame Person of the Year to our summer tour, but. I want to, we're going to make an exception today. I want to tell you that our 2017 Broadcast Pioneer Person of the Year is right there, Bud Gallo. Good. And Bud is the very first tech to ever have this honor, and we are thrilled, and there's nobody better. Thank you. I saw him going out the door, and I said, wait a second, let me tell the people, because they're all your family, and they all want to share with you. But thank you. Okay. We, Jerry's going to take a, one of the wireless microphones, go into the audience to hear from you know one of our good friends, editor Don Buster. But while he's doing that, Don, you stay right there. Uh, Sheeran, why don't you, Dick Sheeran, one of the, again, the greatest writers of all time, who, could, who was assigned to do something that they called Three Blocks Square, where he would just go and sit in a particular area in the city, and he would find a story. And somehow, he always was able to find a story. Dick. Well, Pat, at moments like this, I'm reminded of the speaker who was waxing philosophical for quite a long time. And he said, in conclusion, I want to make 10 points. <laughs> a guy in the back says, start at 9. <laughs> if we keep going, we're going to be celebrating Channel 3's 86th birthday. <laughs> Is it still Wednesday? <laughs> anyway, uh, as a kid who played half ball in South Philly, to be able to be employed and be on and have the honor of being on one of the premier stations. You can imagine how I felt about that. I will tell one story, my favorite story. Many of you have already heard it. It was about interviewing President Carter in the White House. The year is 1980. The Iranians have our people hostage. Jimmy Carter's running against Ronald Reagan. He can't go out to campaign. His people invited local reporters from around the country to come to the White House to interview him to get his message out. I was one of three from our station, very excited, called my wife. I said, guess where I'm going tomorrow? She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the White House. She says, bring me back two cheese subs. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I will say, what can, you know, it was a great honor. I had a lot of fun. I worked with some of the best people as far as cameramen goes. I mean, I, I will tell one, one I, I'm one against my own advice. I'll tell one more story. Phil Curry, the late Phil Curry, was one of the great cameramen, and he was real. You talk about being part of the family. You know, we spent our lives with these guys. 
And, you know, we did all kinds of stories in my 30 years. And, and they were serious and funny. But the greatest times I had were in the truck, okay? And Channel 6 at the time had this campaign. There's that news van again. Well, there was also this place in Pensauken, New Jersey, that had, it, it was a porno place, had nude, a big sign, nude. It also had a place on Route 73. So they had this truck that was painted just like the, the sign outside the porno place on the Admiral Wilson Boulevard. The truck would go from Admiral Wilson Boulevard up Route 73 to Pensauken. And it, ju it looked just like the, the sign on the porno place. And Phil says, as we're rolling down Route 130, there's that nude van again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You know, I love these men uh, and the women who are here. So this has just been really fabulous. There's so many memories that have been laced through um, all these conversations. My dear friend, Ralph DeCoco, who is here. Ralph, it's always wonderful to, to be in the same room with you. Thank you so much for all of your work. Um, and also, you know, one of our really fine editors who um, I think his... His tally for being at the station, he claims is 70 years. I'm not exactly sure whether that's the case or not. But Don, we want you to stay right there where you are. Jerry has a microphone. Give me your best memory of the experience at Channel 3, because we need to have you wrap us up here so we have a really um, a I great afternoon. I would rather afternoon. come up there, if you don't mind. No, I do. Hey, Don, I think I it's great. I would rather no, come up there. I yeah, don't hey. want to hold it. You don't want to hold it. Okay. Hey, Don. Your best memory, honey. That's yeah. it. I have one thing I want to say to you. This is rather unusual. We, we shared something that you didn't know about. A long time ago, you were in New York on a weekend. And you saw less men, less uh, miserables, the musical. And you came back to the uh, studio, uh -huh. and you were so excited. You were talking about that show. Right, it was fabulous. That same Les weekend, Miserables. my wife and I uh -huh. went to New York, and we saw a play called Steel Magnolias. Uh -huh. It was at the WPA. Right. And the reason we went there was my daughter was a managed and director of the WPA. How about that? And that show became a very successful movie. Sure did. With Julia, Julia Roberts, Roberts and Shirley MacLaine. Sally McClain. Field and Shirley MacLaine. And we shared that weekend. You never knew how much I appreciated that yeah, weekend. Yeah, great. I'm so glad. I know. <laughs> that was very special. Yeah. So, 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 Don, do you, do you have, really, because of um, how our day is going, I think would be really great just to hear you share with us, yeah. you know, w one of your one of your best memories of the station, and then send us all out into the afternoon. Okay, I started with Channel Three seventy years ago. Cool. Probably the one person in this room who had an experience seventy years ago, with the exception of you. <laughs> I, the, the night, the day after I graduated from high school, I was 17 years old, I was a member of the Germantown Theater Guild. The next night, Channel 3 produced a play, it was The Importance of Being Earnest, written by Oscar Wilde. It was televised from the Theater Guild live. At least five people who were involved in that production were from Channel 3. I have this program that I have saved over the years, and I was a stage manager for the theater uh, that particular day. I, I would like to read some of the people who were involved there and were involved at Channel 3. If you'll just give me a, mind, a minute to just go back and unfortunately, I forgot my glasses. <laughs> okay, for the first Can guy was Ernest Wawi. He was the play director and uh, the, uh, also the, managed, uh, the operation manager of Channel 3. 
and he did the play that night. And he, he uh, and Bill Smith did the sets. I don't know whether anybody in the room remembers Bill Smith, but Bill Smith was a good scenic designer. He had worked at Channel 3. Both Bill Smith and Ernie Wowing lived at the Germantown Theater Guild. And as a member, I got to meet very good friends. This was in June of 1947, which was 70 years ago. And uh, we did the thing. Bill Smith was quite a guy. I became sort of a, an apprentice with Bill, and I was doing scenery and so forth. And at the time, uh, Bill went to New York eventually, and he uh, was doing sets on the network for the Lux Video Theater. Then he moved to California, and he was a set designer for Gilligan's Island. And also, Bill was one of the set designers for uh, Victor Victoria, in which he was nominated for an Academy Award. Bill Smith also was the best man at my wedding. That was 65 years ago. I'm still married, and Gene is still alive, thank God. Yeah, beautiful. Don, by the way, William Smith, if you look in our current newsletter, we have a long memory of Bill talking about the early days of Channel 3. Right. You saw that. Yeah. Okay, can you capsulize this, because we're running a little late. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, but I have worked, I have worked in this, and while you're up here, Gary, I have this, this is for the archives, okay, and you great. can keep it. it. It's a speech I prepared and a lot of archives, okay. some pictures. Oh, wow. One of, the, that picture is quite interesting. Uh, it hey. was, we did the Taming of the Shrew on July the 2nd, 1947, which was before Channel 6 was on the air. It was rumored at the time that that uh, uh, production of The Taming of the Shrew was the first Shakespearean play ever done in the world on television. So, hey, Don, you yeah. know what? I, I, under, I understand that, and I think that we all need to celebrate the work that you've done and how you've done it, and that you were really at the crossroads in the very beginning. I think a big round of applause for Don and for all for all of our great people who contributed today. And we say to Channel 3, happy 85th birthday. Thank you.